Porto resté. For me, Porto is still magical. First of all, the consumer should know that it was the first wine-producing region to have its appellation defined and protected, and today it possesses the same service area which was set in 1756 by the Marquis of Pombal, Prime Minister of the King Joseph I. He's the one who made the Porto wine-growing region stand out in its entirety. The defined area of the Porto region is exactly the same as it was at the time. But of course, the wine has changed over time. Porto is an exceptional fortified wine, and the secret to its greatness lies in its capacity to age well and in the complexity of the wines produced. The first exports of port were done in 1698. The Portuguese authorized the English to develop businesses in the Douro River. From then, filled ships departed towards England. But the wines were very fragile and badly stored. This is why alcohol was added in order to stabilize them so that they could survive the sale. I like to remind people that Portugal was the European country, the first European country to define and protect wine regions. Everyone talks about France in 1936, even though the wines existed well before. The Spanish did it in 1931 and the Portuguese in 1908. In the case of Porto, it's 1756. Porto's quality is given by the unique climate in Portugal. It is a very rough climate, very hot during the summer and very cold during winter. And the vineyards are planted along the Douro River on steep terraces. Wine plantations in Portugal are native and of multiple varieties. The most famous ones are Tinta Rores, National Toriga, French Toriga, Tinta Sa and Tinta Amarela. These vines produce thick skins and concentrated juices. The difference between a good wine and a great wine is its ability to age. With Porto you have that, that is to say that you have wines that traverse the decades. We can drink Porto wines, great vintages, a hundred years later and we still have wonderful wines. Taylor is a 400-year-old house that has been related to the history of Porto since its beginnings. Taylor owns the Quinta de Vagelis, one of the most beautiful from an architectural point of view. It is also one of the oldest. Grapes are hand collected. They are sent to the Quinta to be trampled underfoot in the lagas. This is a big type of tank where the vintager can come inside. There is a special tradition around trampling in most of high quality Quintas. The vintagers can come inside, arms crossed, and walk together, putting their their legs up at the same time. This allows the grapes to open smoothly under the feet. Pressing grapes by foot in lagers. It's an ancestral method. It's not only done for Porto wine, but also for Dura Reds. The qualitative advantage of pressing by foot is effectively that the pressure that is placed by the feet doesn't allow too much to be extracted or for the seeds to be crushed. We are sure of the pressure and the extraction, which is soft, fine, and allows us to have a quality of tannins that can be as supple as possible compared to that of mechanical pressing, which does not respect the raw material of the grape as much. Another big house of port is Fonseca. Fonseca was bought by Taylor in 1848. Fonseca had a better know-how than Taylor's. Taylor's marketing and Fonseca's know-how was a favorable alliance. As it is the case for other great houses, Croft owns its own Quinta, the Quinta de Rueda. 
This house opened in 1992. It also produces vintage when the year allows it. The port is a universal wine that benefits from an incredible craze. You can have it as an aperitif, with cheese if it's a vintage. If it's a tawny, you can have it with chocolate. And if it's a ruby, with a cigar. There are ports for every taste and every occasion. Well, we're here at um, Crofts Quinta de Rueda, which is a rather large property stretching all along the edge of the riverfront here, right up to the back of the hill. So it's uh, 130 hectares um, of vineyard. And you can see below here that you've got all these um, gentle sort of valleys, and, 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 but relatively flat areas. We look down um, on the vines there. This is a very old uh, property. This would go back to the very early days of um, the Duro Valley and, and grapes being grown here. Um, it's got a long history with our company because um, it was owned by originally by John Fladgate, um, who in fact sold in 1890 to the Croft family. And then when uh, the heirs of the Fladgate partnership, essentially, we bought it back in 2001. We're just at the beginning of uh, the Taylor's Quinta called Vagellas, and you can see behind me, I think, um, <clears throat> the, the hills behind with the vineyards planted up and down and across. And we're going to go around the corner and into the heart of Vagellas where we have the winery and the house, etc. And this is the Quinta we bought in 1893, the Aitman. It is important to know that the Dura Valley is shaped like a seashell. Around the Dura Valley, we have a continental climate. The regions around this seashell have less significant precipitation. And inside it, the temperatures are stronger. We know how to live with dryness. These periods of drought constitute a low supply of water, which is of central importance to Porto wines. For the table wines, producers don't want dry conditions. We use modern terminology to refer to the drought, water stress. This water stress has been an important factor in the history of Porto wines for three centuries. For table wine, drought is a problem, so we use irrigation. So that's the big difference between the natural grapevines used for porto wines and the artificial grapevines used for table wines. Natural weeds that we would have here all die back in the intense heat of the summer. So we have very, very few problems with, uh, with the competition for the vines.
At this part of, uh, of Portugal, we would have what we'd call a continental climate. So if, if we're down by the coast, we've got a lot of rainfall. There's then a mountain range which keeps all that rainfall down by the, the sea. And in here, we get very high uh, temperatures in the summer, very cold winters. And that's ideal for what we do because the cold in the winter will help to um, close the vines down, kill any bugs or diseases there may be. And then in the spring, we've got nice warm conditions, allow perfectly good, you know, good bud burst. And then into the summer, hot, hot, ripe conditions. So what would happen in, in the Douro, for example, we'd have veration when the, the berry turns from being green to being a dark uh, purple. That for us would happen in July. And so through July and August, the, the grapes are continuing to mature in, in the heat. And normally at that time of the year, we have very low rainfall. Uh, for us, our rain falls pretty much in the winter, sometimes a little bit in the spring, but the summer normally very dry conditions. And one of the things you'll notice as you look out over these vineyards here, there's very few weeds because all the grasses that we would have, the natural weeds that we would have here, all die back in the intense heat of the summer. So we have very, very few problems with, uh, with the competition for the vines. Here is a typical example of the nature of the terrain in the Dura Valley. We can see here, in the foreground, the plants that are typical of a Mediterranean climate. We see that the soil is very thin. Below, the bedrock consists of the schist that is present in all of the valley. What is important is the cleavage of the schist, which always occurs vertically. If I can pick this up, you'll see that it's a, it's a soil that we can uh, break up very easily. Um, and the, the vines here will have to push their roots down deep into the soil in order to get to the, to the, to the water um, to allow them to survive. So very high minerals, but very low organic content um, of our soils. Because the depth of the soil is very small, when we plant a grapevine, we have to call in a bulldozer and use dynamite to break apart the bedrock and mix it with the soil. After this, we obtain a soil that is between one meter and one and a half meters deep, with a mix of rock, stone, schist, and earth. Because the cleavage of the schist takes place vertically, the roots of the grapevines can reach a deepness of up to 3, 4 or 5 meters. This is very important for the supply of water to the grapevine. Here is a wide terraced vineyard. A wide terrace is a four meter wide terrace where we plant only two rows of grapevines. This is a model we use when the slope of the terrain is greater than 35%. When the slope is less than 35%, we plant the vines vertically because there is no embankment. Thus, every type of terrain is used for the grapevines. Et 
Here we can see a vineyard with a wider terrace. You can see the important thing about the embankments between the terraces. For the old grapevines, it's a stone wall. For the new grapevines, it's an embankment made of earth. In this embankment, we can easily see the mixture of the stones and earth. In the valley, this is the predominant mixture, and it permits a very strong natural drainage of the soil. The heat collected by the stones during the day is important for keeping the grapes warm during the night. One of the most interesting things about Roeda is that it produces the terroir, the unique style of croft. And I think that's because um, this is a very unusual part of the Douro Valley. It's very flat. Most of the valley, everything is on a steep slope, but here it's relatively flat running into the river. All the, the, herb, the uh, grass and the weeds grow in it, so you have to herbicide to kill them. So it's not organically so wonderful. And what we've done from there is to go on, which you can see just about to the left, above the house there, what we call vertical. It's a, it's a vineyard going straight up and down, you can see it there. Um, which you can only do on obviously up to a certain slope, like 30 or 40 degrees. On those slopes, up and down, you can then plant it up and down. So you eliminate that slope of earth and the patama. You've got a vineyard and you eliminate that problem of organic. We're very keen, you, I think you'll, you'll meet our engineer, um, Antonio Magalhães, who is an incredible viticulturist and produced an organic vin port for the first time ever, and therefore we have organic port, but we also have basically organic or green ideas with all our quintas to try and eliminate the maximum possible of herbicides and all the rest of it. In Taylor's case, which we're here seeing Taylor's, it's, it's, it's the best of this vineyard here and the best of our vineyard down there called Terra Feta, blended together that produces Taylor's vintage port bottling. This Quinta produces a style of Quinta the Vargelas, which, uh, and that with our Quinta the Terra Feta, Nanya Pignon, those two Quinta blended together in an exceptional year, what we call a vintage port. With, with, with port, as you know, you don't, with, with Bordeaux or any other house, anything else, you, you have a vintage every year. With port, we, we actually say, this is an exceptional year, this is a vintage port. And we bottle that at two years in a, in a bottle and it tears in the bottle like a great table wine. I think one of, the, one of the extraordinary things about the Douro Valley and the fact that we've got this mixture of different grape varieties is that we're able to actually plant those varieties in perfect condition. So where, for example, um, on, a, on a slope like this, which is a little bit windier, we would probably tend to uh, plant something like Turiga Francesa or, or Tinta Amarela, which produce very uh, dense bunches. So if there is any rainfall at all, the wind can then clean out all of that moisture. We'd take things like Triga Nacional and typically we'd plant it much lower down in the valley there because it's a very vigorous grape variety. It's actually quite a difficult grape variety to grow, which is why it's fairly rare in the Douro Valley. But by putting it on some of those lower slopes closer to the valley floor, which are hotter, that is a natural way that we can control the vigor um, in, in that grape variety.
This is a very important variety of grape in the region, the Tinta Rorish. It is a grape that has a very sweet juice. One very important thing about these grapes is how easy it is to extract the colors that are in the skin. The ease of this extraction of the color is important for the tinta rorish. The color is important in tinta rorish. When we have a tasting of Tintarorish grapes, we can see the importance of the tannins in the skin. It is very important in the making and selling of Porto wines. Today is the last day of the harvest at Quinta de Panascal. It is October 3rd, and normally the harvests in the valley are done during the second half of September and the first days of October. This year, it is done later than usual because it was a very dry year. We always need it to rain a few times during the summer in order to attain a typical maturity for a Porto juice. Because of the slope, all the harvests in the valley are done by hand. Today they are collecting Tinteradish grapes, but they don't do it every day. We need several tons of Tinteradish, several tons of Torigre Francaise, and several tons of Tintocao to make the blend in the storehouse. It's a very hard job. And the quantity of grapes harvested per day in the new vineyards is between 600 to 800 kilograms per grape picker. It's very important to balance the quantity of grapes that we pick with our capacity to make them in Lagar. So we have to dimension the number of pickers to pick exactly the number of grapes to fill one Lagar a day. They will, in the evening, they'll do the, the treading, and then the next day, they'll go back into the vineyard to pick the grapes to fill the next Lagar. The first phase of treading is what we call the cut, and that's when we line up 22 people in two rows, and they will, over the course of two hours, with having one leader calling the cut, everybody marching in rhythmic step, meet in the middle, and they will go back, then they will turn around in Lagar, and they'll come into the middle and go back. What that is doing, it is creating your first mix where uh, you want to mix in all of the grapes that have been mixed in there and also you want to rip open the berries to release the seeds and allow your fermentation to get into the skins and remove all of the flavor, the color 
and the tannin. And that is why this initial step is so important. The Dodal Valley specializes in making one of the best wines in the world, port wine. And it is the vineyards in these soils of very low fertility that produces grapes with tremendous concentration, both of fruit and color and tannin. And it is these grapes which over centuries have been made in this traditional method of foot treading. It is a very simple process where what matters is the quality of the grapes that you work with. It's not a technological winemaking, but it is a method that has been perfected over centuries. You can see here, sitting on the surface, you have all of the, the pips. That is a sign that the treading has been very effective. In the following day, when the majority of the treaders will go back into the vineyard to fill in the next lagar, we will always keep several people behind, continuously mixing and helping with this extraction of your color and your fruit. What makes port different to, for example, a red wine is that halfway through the fermentation, when half of the sugar has been transformed into alcohol, we run off the juice and we add neutral grape spirit to fortify and stop the fermentation. That retains the natural sugar from the grape, which is what gives the sweetness to port, and the neutral grape spirit raises your alcohol level to 20% to make it stable. That is when port is born. We will then take the skins and we'll put them in a basket press where we will then press these skins to get out the remaining amount of juice, color, and tannin, which is still left in the skins. This is a very important uh, part of your, your port making cycle, which is recovering those pressings, which gets added back, and this press it looks very old fashioned, but in fact, it's very modern. These traditional basket presses, uh, they squeeze to very high pressure, but they're also gentle at the same time. So the quality of the pressings is very high. best ports are made from combining our different grape varieties in the fermentation because each grape variety is going to contribute to the blend with a particular characteristic. Some will give color, some will give flavor, some will give acidity. And uh, what we do is we plant them nowadays separate in the vineyard, but when it comes to the time of the harvest, we will decide each day how many kilos we want of one variety, how many of another. We will bring them together and we will ferment them together as co-fermentation to make more complex, more complete ports.
Il y a une très forte liaison entre le commerce de l'Amio euh, Morio. La Morio There is a very strong link between the cod trade and Porto. It all began in the 17th century with the English, who owned the exclusivity of the global trade of dried cod they fished at Newfoundland. Portugal imports lots of dried cod. They bought this from the English. A Portuguese law obliged them to pay imports, in particular, the cod with food is olive oil, salt and wine. The French paid the dried cod salt, but in port wine. Mais la, la valeur du de la, le sel ne suffit pas pour payer la, la, la morue. Donc ils achètent aussi de l'huile de d'olive. This is why we can say there's a link that's very strong between dry cod and Porto. Toujours dire qu'il y a une très forte liaison entre vent de Porto et la morue. Here it's where we age um, the port wines in wood. There are two types of port wines that age in wood. One uh, is the tonnies that we age in the small casks of around 600 liters. Wines where we have to have uh, a lot of oxidation in order to lose the initial ruby color and to gain a very beautiful amber and tawny color and also to lose the fruity aromas and then to, to gain much more mellow aromas of caramel, vanilla, dry, uh, dry fruits, um, much more mellow wines. These are the tawnies. Then we have rubies and late bottled vintage. These are the port wines that age in big wooden vats, always bigger than uh, 16,000 liters, 20,000 liters. And why? Because we want to keep the initial ruby color and the initial fruitiness. The aging in wood, around four to six years, it's just to allow the wine to be ready to be consumed, just to, to round the wine a little bit without losing this fruitiness and very full color. The wine is done in the Douro Valley. It will stay the first winter in the Douro Valley and then in the following spring. So when the, the weather in the Douro Valley starts to warm, uh, we want the wine to, to come to Villanova de Gaia. We don't want to expose port wine to high temperatures. And Villanova de Gaia is really the perfect place to age wines. And then we have one year to follow the evolution of the wine. Several tastings will be done during this year by the tasting panel in order to follow the evolution of the wine. And then it's on the, the St. George's Day, the 23rd of April of the following year, uh, that the company has to take the decision if the wine has vintage quality. And the wine has vintage quality if it's uh, exceptional good wine if it has an enormous aging potential so the wine should, can stay close in the bottle at least 20 years and 
if the wine has these characteristics, so the, the, the house will declare Taylor's classic port. We have these big vats here in this lodge number two and also in the lodge number three. So two lodges where we keep the best reserves that we, uh, we expect they will become a quality of a classic vintage port. Ruby is the word for the younger port because it's still an English word um, from the English. Uh, ruby is big, big colour ruby port when it's young. Uh, and late bottle vintage is still has some of the rubiness of the youth and the fruit in it. And there you have it. Lovely smell, lovely wind. You, you've got all the fruit in it. And then with the tawny, which has now dropped its colour in the cask, and turned into tawny colour, and it's mellow. And now the thing about tawny, and this is a 20 year old or the 10 year old, this is the 20, the 10 year old, it's wonderful. Keep that in the fridge. Every fridge should have a bottle of 10 year, 20 year old in the fridge, particularly in the summer and winter, because it, it, it just being cool like that. You can have it really like, um, like a sauterne, really, you, with foie gras. Excellent, but ben, basically people are going to drink it with um, a, a dessert, a creme caramelli type dessert, almond tart, etc. And then you've got the lightness, um, the lightness of body, and the tawny, the toffee, lovely mellow toffee, caramelli flavours, but go with that food. Then we have vintage port. Vintage port is very much the, the, the furthest you can reach in port. These are ports which have incredible amount of quality, uh, structure, dimension, which will be bottled after two years. We will use a, a driven cork so that they will carry on aging in a bottle. A vintage port will live for a minimum of 50, 60 years, and some of the great years, like the 2009, these will go on for a century of aging in the bottle. Pink Port, as we called it, um, is a fairly new product. Uh, basically, in 2005, I wondered why we weren't making rosé port. After all, many other great wine regions of the world produce rosé. And we tried to, to launch it. We made a very good progress uh, product. We made it here at Rueda. But the regulations within the port industry said that we couldn't do it. Port had to be either white or to be red. And uh, so what we did is we found a little loophole in the regulation and, and, called, and, and, and used a trademark which was, was pink. And so Croft Pink was born. But the whole idea behind it um, was that it was producing a port that was a, a lighter style, a, a style of port that was very well suited to summer consumption and perhaps to uh, younger consumption. And it's been hugely successful, both as an aperitif, but also where we've sold it in cocktails and, and bars around the world, where a lot of people have got very excited about drinking Croft Pink um, as a cocktail. The interesting thing about pink is that pink is um, 
is a port that, as I say, is made from the same grape varieties that we make normal port from, but it's made over a longer period of time. So normally, with port, from the start of picking the grapes to the moment of fortification is three and a half days. With pink, it's about um, 10 days. And the reason for that is we have a small amount of skin contact, maybe eight to 12 hours of skin contact, and then we're decanting off the skin and then fermenting in a cold fermentation. And what the cold fermentation uh, does is it, it brings out a lot of the more delicate aromas. So now we get these lovely sort of delicate, straw, soft strawberries, raspberries, um, very light, very fresh. So this is the Croft Pink. Cheers. However, whichever way it is, it's the most wonderful place to come up and do what I'm about to do now. You take white port, dry white port. This is the unusual, extraordinary thing about in port. Ferment it out to dry before adding some white, white spirit to um, bring it up 20%. So chip dry is dry as a chip chip dry and you, you can either have it straight, of course, lovely, or what we call, we put, put it like that. I would like to do it one third talk port, two thirds tonic, with, this is Gillian's particular thing, she always puts eau de cologne mint. Not any mint, but eau de cologne mint in it, like that. And then we take the two and we go... Riva. Riva. <laughs> The, uh, the port industry is still very dominated uh, for the volume part of the industry on the old European economies. So it would be on, on France and on, on, on Belgium and on Spain and, and Holland and Portugal itself. This is where a lot of volume of port is consumed. But what we're finding increasingly is the top quality, which is what we at our company really focus on, is increasingly becoming uh, a worldwide drink. And so we're selling a lot of port in, in South America, in North America, in the Far East, uh, also, of course, in, in Europe and in, in the United Kingdom, which is a very old market for us because, you know, here at Croft, it's, the, the company started uh, from England back in uh, 1588. So uh, it's, a, it's a traditional English, English company, but we're now selling port to all corners of the world. town of Porto was really the, the port to, of export and importation of many, many goods. Uh, one of the most important was, of course, port wine. And here was really a very busy commercial town uh, where the, 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 the business was done in, in, port, in the town of Porto. And then the boats would be charged with wine that was aging in Villanova de Gaia and sent to mainly uh, in the first markets was UK, but also, also to Holland, to Germany, and then uh, with the following years to many, many different markets, and then Brazil and Canada, US. Here it's the vintage cellar, so it's where we keep our vintage port aging. Most of them it's the private reserve of the company because when we declare vintage ports it's immediately sold. As you know, uh, vintage port is a small percentage of the, the, the best crop of an exceptional year. So vintage port it's only produced roughly three times every 10 years, so every decade. Um, and when Taylor's announces the declaration of a vintage port, it's immediately sold all over the world.
port wine needs to be explained. It's so varied, so many differences, has so much to say. So it's important that the tourists that take their time to visit us, we, we are here prepared to give them all this information, to educate them to the different styles of port, to this unique region. And at Taylor's we do the same. We want our tourists to come here and to have a great experience, a great learning experience of what is this unique wine. We receive uh, tourists from all corners of the world, really, uh, from New Zealand to Canada, from Japan to, to Chile. Uh, of course, Europe dominates the, 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 the nationalities that we receive. We receive a lot of English, a lot of Spanish, but also a lot of Canadians and Americans and Italians and uh, uh, more and more.